Welcome to South First. I'm Anusha Ravisu. The Delhi police decided that uh, in an early morning activity on Tuesday, they will go and knock on the doors of journalists, senior journalists, consultants, contributors. Journalists were just starting on uh, with their careers and seized their phones, laptops, work material, all of this in connection on Wednesday. The question here is also about the rights of citizens in a democracy like India. And to discuss precisely that, I'm very, very glad that I have Paranjat Guhatakurta himself who was also questioned by the Delhi police for hours on Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining South First. So it's an honor to have you here. Let me first ask you, what- Thank you, thank you so much, and Anusha. Thank you very much to all the uh, viewers of, of South First for uh, inviting me to, uh, to your program. Yes, please. A response that you gave to the media as you were being driven away last evening in your car intrigued me quite a bit. Modi ji mahan hai. Aur aur puche na. Modi ji bhagwan ka avatar hai. Aur puche na aur Is there a particular reason that you chose to use those words when you wanted to describe the prime minister? You know, uh, I, the the police personnel had arrived at my home at about six thirty in the morning, and they were there for about two hours or so. And then I went along with them to the office of the special cell of the Delhi police. So we must have arrived there uh, around 10 o'clock or maybe a little earlier. And I was in that place all the way through till about six o'clock. And there were eight different individuals from the rank of sub-inspector, inspector, inspector additional commissioner of police, all the way up to the deputy inspector general of police, who spoke to me, questioned me, you might even say interrogated. So as I was walking out, you know, I, there was these <laughs> dozens of camera persons who were waiting for a sound bite. Uh, I, I later learned that uh, others like uh, Abhishek Sharma, Udmilesh had not spoken to them. So, I mean, I was literally pounced on by about, but uh, I, I can't remember how many, but there were about 15 or 20 camera persons uh, and journalists. And they asked me uh, a whole lot of questions and I can come back to those questions because uh, and, you know, I'm giving you this little bit of a background to explain why I said what I did. So, so I said, look, I, I, I am who I am. I've been, I've spending, I have spent 46 years as a journalist. I, I'm accredited to the Press Information Bureau of the Government of India and uh, you know, I've been asked a whole lot of questions, a whole lot of questions, several questions were asked of me, the same question were asked over and over again. It's not just the details of, you know, what uh, my association with NewsClick is. And I said, I'm not an employee. I'm a consultant. And I will be, um, um, you know, I've, I don't have, I'm, I'm not part of the ownership. I don't have anything to do with the editorial policy. You know, I've come, I've done my programs. Uh, they've asked me to speak and so on and so forth. I've been a consultant all the way from May 2018. And thereafter, you know, I mean, I was getting a certain remuneration. I was getting a lakh and a half rupees per month minus the tax deducted at source. And then post-COVID, uh, everybody, everybody, including NewsClick, was going through a bad phase. So uh, uh, that remuneration was cut down to about a lakh. And there were several months when I did not raise an invoice. Okay, why am I giving you all this? Because I was asked this over and over and over again. Now, let's move on a little bit. Uh, so I said all kinds of questions were asked. They, they asked me, have you, have you, I mean, they obviously had tracked my phones. They said, do you use Signal? I said, of course I use Signal. They said, have you covered the Delhi riots, the Hindu Muslim riots, the anti-Muslim anti riots in, in Delhi? I said, no. But he said, have you covered the, 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 the farmer's agitation? I said, yes. So all, all this was going on and they were asking me questions which I found frankly ludicrous. They said, have you spoken to one Mr. S. Bhatnagar in the US? I said, of course I have. He happens to be my brother-in-law. My, my my wife's brother. Yes, I've spoken with him. Uh, they asked me, have you spoken to so-and-so person in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Who have you spoken to in Hong Kong? All kinds of questions were asked to me. And then after all these questions were asked, I, I said the same thing in Hindi. And I was sort of mentally, physically exhausted by then. And I was getting into my vehicle 
when another bunch of these same guys, and they were literally trusting that the, their, their uh, microphones on my face. So I said, you know, I, I saw A and I over there, and I said, okay, what's the question you want to ask me? Let me give you an answer. I said, Modi ji mahan hai. Modi ji is a great man. I said, Modi ji bhagwan ka avatar hai. And, and, and I said, Modi ji, you know, you're God's avatar. You're, you're like akin to God. Little could I have realized that that little clip of me sitting in a vehicle saying all these things would go viral. I didn't know, you know. I just got access to my phone after they'd cloned it, etc. But before that, something unusual also happened. There was a lady by the name of Simran who kept asking me, what did they ask you about News League? What did they ask you about this? And, you know, I said, you're from Republic Television. She said, yes. So let me tell you. I think once upon a time, Arnab Goswami used to be a journalist. But today he's a monstrous caricature of what a journalist should be. He said, you haven't answered my question. I said, you once called me up and then recorded my conversation without my permission. So I've become a little smarter. Let me answer your question. And I repeated myself, you know, once upon a time, Arunab Goswami used to be a journalist and today he's a monstrous caricature of what a journalist should be. So all this was happening yesterday where I had been literally with the cops from 6.30 in the morning till about 6 p.m. in the evening. I mean, they were very kind to me. A hundred times they said, you want tea, you want coffee, you want... Puri, you want chola, you want this, something to eat, something to drink, etc. And that, that was how it happened. Okay, so there I is stop. No... I'm giving a very, very long answer to your question. No, no, there is no... Uh, in fact, you ended up answering the next question I intended to ask you, which was what if you can elaborate on what exactly transpired yesterday. So I will not bore you with that question again. But what I would... I will <laughs> not take away from the kindness of the Delhi police that was so gracious in offering you so many cups of chai and... I, I, I don't know. I, I just hope but... they're equally kind to... Rabir Purakashta, who has been remanded to police custody for seven days as we talk. I hope they're equally kind to News Clicks, uh, the person uh, in the Human Resources de uh, Department, Amit Chakraborty, who is physically challenged. I hope they're as kind to them as they were to me. Not taking I away really from their so. kindness, I would really like to know if they also follow due process. Was there a search warrant? Could you? Did they? Was there? Did they, since they also seized uh, electronics, including phones, laptops? Right. Right. Did they give you right. a memo? Right. Is did they follow right. due process? Let me answer that question. I frankly don't know what is the due process when a first information is lodged under the UAPA, that's the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. I really don't know. If they had a search warrant, they didn't show it to me. When they asked me for my personal electronic devices, notably my mobile phone, I said, I won't give it to you unless you give it to me in writing. So the particular inspector said, why don't you come with us to the, the cell, to the special, uh, the, the special cell of the Delhi police, which is in Lodi Road. And I'm, I'm in Gurgaon, in the outskirts, uh, on the suburbs, you can say, of, the, uh, of Delhi. So it, it took us about an hour and a half. So we must have left at about 8.30 and we reached there about 10. And he said, okay, we'll give you everything. And finally, uh, the, it's a slightly longer and a complicated story. Before I handed over my mobile phone to them, I said, give it to me in writing. So then they gave me a, 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 a document, uh, which, is some, which, which is called a seizure memo, which looks like this. You know, it's a handwritten document. And, and I said, okay, here it is. Uh, I signed that you received it. And there are two witnesses and the inspector is given there. And when they returned it, I also mentioned. So... I understand, I understand that others did not insist on following this process. And they just sort of handed over their mobile phones and their laptops. Uh, I understand again that in several cases, their hard disks, their pen drives, their mobile phones were taken and they haven't been returned. In several cases, I've been told the mobile phones, the instruments are with the police but the SIMS, the SIM, the subscriber identity module has been returned. 
in my case, maybe I'm privileged or maybe they were extremely nice to me. They returned uh, both my phone and and my my with the phone the the uh, the sim and, and they kept I, I said why don't you give me the hash value of that i said this is not the first time my phone has been uh the data from that phone has been extracted you know uh when the pegasus investigation was on i, I my phone was forensically examined on five five occasions thrice in in, in europe and canada and uh once in delhi once in kolkata be that as it may the short point is uh, i said i want the hash value because I don't want a situation where you planted something in my phone which wasn't there. He said, look, look, we are doing it in front of you. So by saying I cooperate with the investigation, it also means I, I tell them, okay, the, this is my, my password. You know, so to open my phone, you have to press the following uh, six digits and so on and so forth. So I did cooperate, cooperate with them. I had to change my Apple ID, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's the short point. What is the due process under the UAPA? you should actually speak to a legal expert on the subject. All I can say, and I say this because whatever limited understanding I have of the law, is that I understand it is arguably the most draconian piece of legislation in the country at present. So the way I look at it, if the enforcement directorate, which is under the Ministry of Finance, they had raided the offices of NewsClick, they had kept Prabir and his partner in their home for five days in February of 2021. After that, the income tax department came, the economic offenses wing of the Delhi police came. And then News Click, uh, Prabir Purakast and others moved court. They got a stay against what is described as coercive action. Now that trial was scheduled to begin and and, and all this has happened. So, so I mean, what, what, what would a, a, a lay person uh, make sense of it? They couldn't get him under the the Prevention of Money Laundering Act and the Foreign Exchange Management Act or the Income Tax Act or what have you. The CRPC, the Criminal Procedure Code and the Indian Penal Code. So you finally got him uh, uh, um, in police custody for seven days under the UAPA. I mean, this is my understanding. And I want to make one other point, which uh, question though you haven't asked it. I don't think there's been ever a precedent of this kind. I don't think there's ever been odd journalists. And not just journalists, as you rightly pointed out, there were activists, there were all kinds of people who were simultaneously raided. There were hundreds of police persons who went to, you know, something like 40 different homes. I mean, I mean, uh, when we were going from uh, uh, our place, the, the people who had come to get me, I mean, they were asked to come in the middle of the night. They weren't, they didn't know what was happening. I mean, their, their operations began at about four in the morning. Otherwise, how would they reach, you know, uh, over 30 different locations in different parts of the national capital region and outside it too, in Mumbai, among other places, all simultaneously at about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. Okay. It is as though what, what you're describing, the nature of these raids or uh, the personnel who had arrived not just at your place and the multiple locations where these raids happen. All of this was expected, anticipated when the union government brought in UAPA. All of this was anticipated. These were precisely the arguments that were made, not just by journalists, but also advocates, legal experts, civil society members and activists that the UAPA has the potential of being exploited to target, intimidate, harass. Now, these also are the words that have been used to describe what happened with the raids yesterday. Since you were also questioned, let me ask you, do you look, look at this as harassment, intimidation of journalists? Yes, yes, and I do. Challenge to I do. Pre free press. I do. I indeed do. Uh, I, I do see this as a kind of harassment. I see this, a, this as an intimidation, whereas the police were not just kind to me at a personal level. They were super, super kind to me. But no, the entire operation, you picked up people, freelance journalists who have written just a few articles for the portal. You picked up a designer who's learning on the job. You picked up camera persons. You picked up all kinds of people and in, in the cases of academics, 
uh, a retired professor like Dilip Simeon, uh, 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 a political and social activist like Dholakia Ji. I mean, I, I wonder what is the purpose? And the only conclusion that I can draw is that this is part of, yes, the UAPA has been misused or, or uh, used to intimidate, used to harass. We have the uh, Bhima Khoregao, uh, the persons uh, who have been uh, charged under uh, the UAPA in the Bhima Khoregao uh, episode. We know what happened to Father Stan Swami. But this has never happened to journalists. And I mean, let's look at some of the facts of the case. I'm, I mean, this is again, sum I, I'm summarizing. I, I don't have the evidence. I, I haven't seen the first information report. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, if others have seen the first information report. That first information report was lodged at uh, on the 18th of August, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, let, let me just check. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, yes, it is dated, sorry, 17th of August. 17th of August, 178. So almost a month and a half later, all these things happened. It, it is sending a chilling effect. It has a chilling effect, let me put it. It sends a message to all journalists that this is what the government is capable of doing. That message is really a chilling message. Okay. Uh, this is, again, based on the social media. There was an article in the New York Times which pointed out that an American citizen, Neville Roy Singham, had, he was a very, very successful entrepreneur, and Prabir Purakasta, the head of NewsClick, has had a formal association with him. They are both uh, kind of uh, have that interest in, um, in, in that area of computer software. They had a company. And then this particular gentleman has several entities through which one particular entity has financially supported NewsClick. And according to the New York Times, Mr. Neville Roy Singham is allegedly very close to the Chinese Communist Party. But neither the New York Times, nor to the best of my knowledge, has any accusation of illegality been leveled against Mr. Neville Roy Singham. This is to the best of my knowledge. I've gone through that New York Times report. And, and then what happens? What are you now suggesting? I, are you, I mean, I mean, I'm just again going by all the, the speculation in the media. These are not facts. I don't have those facts. Is what is it? Is money that comes from China to, to the US and comes back to India through another entity to News Click, which is allegedly pro-Chinese. Look, the links appear tenuous as at best, ridiculous perhaps. It's up to the law of the land. It's up to the courts of the land to find out whether the private limited company called PPK News Click Private Limited has violated any law. I do not want to adjudge. I'm not a judge. I don't have the facts. I'm not part of the ownership. I'm not part of the management. If they have violated the law, they should take action. But there are cases going on under the, the instituted by the enforcement directorate. The enforcement directorate, the Delhi High Court had said that there should not be any coercive action. So why all this? Why all this? The, the only, only, only explanation in positions of power and responsibility. They don't want independent critical journalism to continue in this country. That's the only conclusion I can draw. You spoke about speculations in media, which brings me to uh, one of the last questions I have for you. Ever since these raids, there has clearly been bipolar reaction to the raids on journalists within the fraternity. There is an entire section that truly believes uh, that this is an attack on press freedom, that this is an attack on seeking account on a profession that seeks accountability from the government. But there is also a section within the fraternity that believes, why should you stand up for those who are accused of hobnobbing with an enemy state? And I say this 
in I say this exactly verbatim as said in many, many circles, although the Indian government has not announced China as an enemy state, I do not understand where they draw this inference from nonetheless, but this seems to be this bipolar, there seems to be this bipolar reaction. So let me understand from you, your reading of how the fraternity, the journalistic fraternity in India has responded to these raids and is it disappointing? Yes, it is disappointing. I've been a journalist for 46 years, as I said at the beginning of our conversation. Uh, journalists have never been there, uh, known for their solidarity. More often than not, journalists are often their own worst enemies. There's that lack of brotherhood and sisterhood among several journalists. But on the issue of the media being polarized, you also have to acknowledge that Indian society today is more polarized than in a very, very, very long time. And polarized, not only along religious lines, but on political lines. Such a large section of my brothers and sisters in the media are today towing the line of the government. They are not asking difficult questions to those who are in power. They are, this is the way many journalists are one whether they are ideologically on the side of the Bharatiya Janata Party and the Narendra Modi government, whether they find that they don't have a choice if they have to uh, keep the home fires burning, then they have to, you know, go along with uh, what their owners, their, their proprietors are saying. He who pays the piper calls the tune. The dependence on government advertising, in particular the advertising of the central government, you can say, has become uh, relatively big. I mean, that, this is a longer story, uh, but the point is journalists or a very large section of Indian journalists are today more critical of the opposition than the ruling party. They're not willing to ask difficult questions. Narendra Modi is the first and so far only prime minister of India who's never held an unscripted press conference, media conference, where any journalist was free to ask him any question. He hasn't done it in the last more than nine years that he's been in power, okay? Even in 2019, when the Bharatiya Janata Party under Mr. Modi returned to power, you remember he was there at the headquarters of the Bharatiya Janata Party and Mr. Amit Shah took all the questions. He didn't answer any of the questions. Mr. Modi has selected particular journalists he's given interviews to, I can name them for you if you wish to. You want me to name them? Please oh, go ahead. Long... This is this yeah, is Mr. this is a no hold yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, I mean, Rajat Sharma, ma, he's always been ideologically aligned towards the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh. He was a member of the Akhil Bharatiya Vidyati Parishad. So uh, I, I'm kind of not including Rajat in this category. By the way, he was not even named in that uh, infamous G14 uh, group of so-called Godi media anchors. But but you you look at all of them. Amish Devgan, Anjana Om Kashyap, uh, Sudhir Chaudhary, uh, Deepak Chaurasya, Navika Kumar, uh, Rahul Shiv Shankar, affectionately called RSS. And, and one can go on and on and on and, and name all of these guys. But he picked and chose these individuals. And, and let me say, let me suggest, they didn't really ask him tough questions. And even when they asked him a question, say on demonetization, they didn't follow it up with cross questions. They were, I would say, soft to him. Mr. Modi has even granted an interview to a well-known actor, Akshay Kumar. Yes, he's a high income taxpayer, he's a very popular actor. He used to be a citizen of Canada. And, and he recounted, he asked a question which his driver wanted him to ask of Mr. the Prime Minister. Mananiya Pradhan Mantri, aap aam kaise khate hai? I mean, how do you eat your mango? Do you cut it or do you suck on it kind of thing? Look, if this is what the media or a large section of the media is all about, then look, I don't think the fourth estate can be called the fourth estate. I don't think the media is then doing its job in a democracy, holding accountable those who are in positions of power and authority, acting as, as the proverbial uh, uh, an, in, an, an institution that uh, uh, that that uh, you know uh, uh, in, in, ensures there are checks and balances. 
So I, I don't think you never see, I, I don't think you, you've ever seen such a uh, large section of the media so subservient to those involved, uh, particularly, certainly not since the 1970s when Indira Gandhi imposed the emergency in, in, in 75, uh, all the way up to 77. So yes, uh, uh, I am uh, deeply disappointed with large sections of the media and I uh, am disillusioned with the attitudes and the actions of many of my brothers and sisters in the profession. Not everybody. And the unfortunate truth is that those who are not, those who are independent, those who are critical, uh, it's not a quest question of intolerance. It's a question of targeting them. Vengeful, a vengeful attitude. That's what the present regime has displayed. The last question to you, and you can treat it as a question on the lighter way in things. Were you surprised you were not asked any questions about your investigations into Adani businesses? Not at all. I volunteered some information to them. I said, look, uh, I'm the only citizen of India against whom lawyers engaged by companies that are controlled and uh, well headed by Sri Gautam Adani. I'm the only citizen against whom there are currently six cases of defamation that are pending in different courts of law. Five in Gujarat, one in Rajasthan. And I also happen to have the dubious distinction of being the only journalist who has been, Indian journalist who has been named in the Hindenburg Research Report, which appeared on the 24th of January. So if you go through all 32,000 words of it, uh, 88 questions were asked of Mr. Gautam Adani. I feature in question number 84. Yes, well, thank you so much, and Mr. Takurta. And, and if I may add a little uh, color to our thing, there's a very, very well-known saying in different Indian languages in different parts of India, you know, that you can wake, wake up a person who's sleeping, but you can't wake up a person who's pretending to sleep. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope Thank people you, wake Mr. up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Takurta, for uh, joining us on South First and sharing the experiences that you were subjected to over the last 24 hours. Thank you.